This is David Harvey, and you're listening to the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a podcast that looks at capitalism through a Marxist lens. This podcast is made possible by Democracy at Work. I've taught uh, Marxist Capital, uh, Volume 1, many, many times in my career. And uh, last night uh, was the final session of uh, yet another uh, course on this. And the final session deals with uh, what Marx calls primitive or original accumulation, which is the story of how capital came to power, how it came to be what it is. And one of the interesting things about capital as a book is that Marx changes his writing style depending upon the nature of the uh, materials he's covering. There are some passages which are very lyrical, there are some passages that are very sort of densely theoretical, there are some passages which are sort of detailed historical materials. Uh, but the final session on primitive accumulation is dealing with very short, sharp chapters which are very brutal uh, in their impact. And I think what Marx is trying to do through his writing style is to uh, emphasize the brutality uh, and the violence through which capital came to be what it is. Now, this story that Marx tells of the origins of capital uh, is one which uh, goes against uh, prevailing opinion. Uh, Marx himself had to deal with the way in which uh, uh, political economy of the time uh, recorded how capital began, and it was a virtuous story. Uh, there were some people who were kind of uh, careful and thoughtful and in detail kind of looked after things and uh, were responsible. And then there were those who were kind of just wanted to spend their time in riotous living. And so the origins of capital was depicted as a virtuous story where virtue won out and the virtuous people became the entrepreneurs. They became the people who deferred gratification who uh, looked to the future, uh, and the riotous people were left with the possi only possibility of making a living, which was to offer uh, their labor power to the capitalists. So this was the kind of story, and Marx kind of says, that's uh, a fantasy, that never really happened that way. The other story which, uh, with which we're now more familiar, but which was around in Marx's time, was that it was Christian virtue that uh, Max Weber later on wrote the famous text about uh, the Protestant ethic and the origins of capitalism, in which uh, an ethical Protestantism came uh, to the rescue of an economic system by, again, uh, Quaker virtue and deferred gratification and uh, careful management of money and entrepreneurial skills and things of that kind. Now, Marx uh, takes both of these stories. Uh, obviously, he didn't have the Weber story, but there was a, a virtue, a, a, a kind of argument around saying it had to have something to do with uh, the nature of uh, Christianity and Martin Luther and uh, all, all the rest of it. So Marx takes both of those and dismisses them uh, with a, a kind of almost a brutal wave of one hand. He kind of says, look, the reality was that capital came into being in, as he says, uh, letters of blood and fire. It was a violent, violent thing. The usurpation of a former system of governance, uh, a usurpation of power relations, uh, the, the robbery, thievery, violence, fraudulence, uh, the misappropriation of state power, the utilization of almost every kind of criminal means that you could possibly uh, imagine. So this is the story that Marx wants to tell. And maybe he overdoes it a bit, but on the other hand, uh, when we look back, we see there was a good deal of what he was talking about going on throughout this history. And he dismisses the religious story also by kind of saying, you know, the religious people, if you want to see what they really did, just look at the way in which the parish is organized uh, the uh, treatment of the the poor in the poor houses and and uh, the orphanages and uh, that and he says what you will really see is that these were mini prisons and there was an incarceration politics going around and a violent kind of repression of human dignity and and and, and the like given the way in which uh, Christianity in practice dealt with problems of unemployment problems of uh, lack of uh, access to the living standards. But the main story Marx wants to do to tell is the violent means by which uh, 
that mass of the population were deprived of access to the means of production, to the ways of uh, actually reproducing their daily life. And this violent appropriation uh, and this violent uh, reorganization of uh, the social order uh, was, as far as Marx was concerned, the original sin of what capital was about. And I think that it's interesting to see the way in which he sets up uh, this notion of an original sin, because there are some thinkers, uh, for instance, uh, Derrida, who would kind of say that any social order, as it comes into being, uh, bears the marks of its violent origins and can never expunge uh, that history, and that therefore the violence of its origins continually haunt it and, re and return again and again and again to haunt us. And I think this is a very good moment, actually, historically, uh, to look at the return of many of these violent forms of expropriation, expulsions, uh, evictions and the like, which uh, Marx describes as being present in the, in, the, in the very origins of capitalism. So this is a good moment to uh, return to uh, this moment of original sin uh, of uh, capital accumulation, because it is about evictions and expulsions, and of course we're seeing a good deal of that going on. And the fraudulence and the uh, lying and the telling of uh, mystical kind of stories to cover over uh, the egregious uh, appropriation which is going on of wealth and power on the part of very small groups in the population. This is a rather uh, interesting moment then to kind of say, that are we actually uh, currently being haunted by this t tale of, 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 of violence and primitive accumulation? So Marx's argument then is that the preceding order, the feudal order, uh, was undermined in a number of uh, very distinctive ways. It was undermined partly by merchant capitalist practices, which were uh, very much based on, on buying cheap and selling dear and uh, frequently uh, the appropriation of... Uh, uh, commodities from populations which were not in a position to be able to resist uh, the, the military and the financial power of a, a merchant capitalist order. Uh, the order was also undermined by usury and, and uh, the money lender and, and, and the like. So if you put together the money lender and the merchant capitalist, uh, together they undermined feudal power and then generated the possibility of a vast accumulation of capital in very few hands. And that vast accumulation of capital was then used uh, to try to dispossess the mass of the population. So the story of primitive accumulation, as Marx lays it out, is really the formation of the working class. That is, of a class that had no means of existence apart from selling its labor power in labor markets. And this is, if you like, the secret uh, that Marx wishes to un wishes to uh, revealed to us through various historical stages. It occurs, of course, at first on the land. So you get the appropriation of the land, the enclosure of the land, the existence of private property on the land, and the gradual assembly of the land through the despoliation of the ecclesiastical estates, uh, the taking away of uh, uh, and the privatization of uh, state ownership uh, of the land, and that privatization in the end produced a class of, if you like, uh, agricultural capitalists, landed capitalists, uh, who, uh, whose main task was to uh, separate workers from the land so that they, had, uh, they were forced out into the streets. And then what this meant, Marx argues, is a collapse uh, of a social order uh, that had been based upon uh, the, the, the access to, to the commons. And so one of the big movements that we see is the enclosure of the commons, which is actually a legal process. And Marx emphasizes the way in which illegal processes of expropriation eventually become legal processes of uh, expropriation as the state is, in effect, commanded by capital to the point where the state is going to pass laws well, which are going to uh, expropriate uh, populations and privatize uh, access to the land. But the industrial capitalist, of course, arises in a different way. The industrial capitalist takes uh, landed 
property as its basis, but then takes money power and starts to use money uh, to make more money. And that is, if you like, the real origins of what capital is about. So this is a remarkable story that Marx uh, tells in Capital, and he tells it in various, in, in, in various uh, ways. But one of the things that is very striking about it is the tremendous hypocrisy upon which uh, this uh, system is, is founded. And the hypocrisy really lies in this, that on the one hand, liberal theory takes the view that private property arises because individuals mix their labor with the land and they therefore have a right to the product of their own labor. But of course, workers do not have a right to the product of their own labor because the product of their labor belongs to capital. And workers do not have a right either to control the labor process because the labor process is designed uh, by capital. So that there is a theory of liberal rights in the works of John Locke and the like, uh, which turns out to be completely perverted, turned on its head uh, by what happens uh, in the 17th and 18th centuries as uh, society begins to move towards uh, a more capitalist uh, social order. Now, the reason I think this is important to look at is to ask the question, uh, to what degree are these processes of primitive accumulation still with us? Because one of the th ideas that comes out of Marx's capital is that once upon a time, capital was, as it were, uh, riddled with this illegal, uh, violent uh, processes. But once capital was, as it were, uh, centered uh, and, and, and has assumed power, then all that illegal illegality can uh, be actually done away with and we left with a society where, as Marx puts it, uh, the, 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 the sort of the subtle economy of decision making through an economic system uh, precludes uh, violent expropriations and the like. So you would get the impression from the first part of uh, Marx's capital that this peace, there's, there's essentially a, a peaceful market process, that market exchange is well established, uh, that uh, the equalization of the rate of profit is well established. All of these things are well established and that therefore uh, the system is going to be working out in a rather utopian way. And in fact, what Marx does is to take up uh, the, the utopian visions of the, the, the classical political economy and Adam Smith and Ricardo and the like and kind of say, all right, let's accept uh, that utopian vision and then try to sort of figure out how capital uh, is actually going to be working on the basis of this uh, free market exchange, uh, a legal system based on private property rights and, and, and the like. So you get the impression that once upon a time there was this violent uh, confrontation which led to the rise of capital but then afterwards capital sort of settled down and became a legal kind of kind of system and everything was being worked out according to the laws of motion of capital accumulation which of course did indeed benefit the rich vis-a-vis uh, -vis the poor but nevertheless it was uh, a legal kind of process and, and uh, therefore uh, violence and uh, uh, appropriation and expulsions and so on were lo no longer necessary. But what I really want to argue is that right now, if we look at uh, the way in which society is being organized, we see a great deal uh, of violent expropriation going on. We see a great deal of, uh, uh, of, uh, of violence in, in relationship to, to, to labor. We see a daily violence uh, actually occurring in society. And there's a sense in which we might kind of say this is the original sin of capital actually returning to haunt us. Uh, and at this particular historical moment, it's becoming uh, a crucial kind of uh, question and uh, uh, how to confront uh, what in effect is the illegality of capital. Because it is unfortunately not the case that the, the, the theory of capital which, to which we have been uh, exposed by classical political economy and the economists, the theory of capital as a peaceful system uh, is no longer uh, a reasonable uh, position to take, that in fact what we're dealing with or have to look at is the continuation and in fact the resurrection of systems of violent expropriation and a form of capital arising which is based uh, 
uh, not upon uh, the equality of exchange, but which is based upon the equality of, of exchange, which then leads to a certain violence of expropriation. There has been some uh, controversy over the degree to which uh, the techniques and practices of uh, primitive accumulation uh, actually continue throughout the long history of uh, capitalism. Uh, a, a couple of uh, thinkers have uh, actually argued uh, that uh, you cannot uh, envisage a society that would actually be stabilized without uh, the continuation of some of these practices. And this is particularly the case uh, with uh, Hannah Arendt, and it's also the case with Rosa Luxemburg. Uh, Rosa Luxemburg actually went out of her way to say that Marx's account of the continuity of capitalist production uh, is missing out on something, and that the expansion of the system uh, which is required for capital accumulation could not be orchestrated uh, through processes of accumulation which were internalized within the dynamic of capitalism. So Rosa Luxemburg sort of said, look, the only way in which uh, actually capital continue is by having a place outside of the dynamics of capitalism upon which uh, capital accumulation can feed. And that outside of was actually registered through uh, colonial and imperialist practices, that the expansion uh, of uh, capital uh, depended upon primitive accumulation occurring on the margins of a capitalist society, and that would be a permanent condition uh, of what capital was about. Uh, so, in a sense, she was saying uh, imperialism is a necessary feature of a capitalist society, primitive accumulation on the periphery, uh, but when uh, the periphery is totally absorbed and there's no place to go, uh, then that would be the end of capitalism. That's what basically uh, she, was, uh, she was arguing. But meanwhile, uh, she said there's a real difference between understanding the dynamics of capital as a sort of, sort of system, which is kind of smoothly kind of uh, working, uh, and uh, the rough and tumble which is going on on the periphery, uh, so that uh, the absorption of uh, areas on the periphery into uh, the capitalist system was always going to be based upon uh, violent appropriations and expropriations and the violence of uh, imperialist interventions. Now this uh, uh, thesis is, I think, uh, a, an interesting one to look at because to some degree Marx uh, accepts that because uh, he recognizes that the expansion of the system requires an expansion of access to raw materials as well as an expansion in the market. And when he points this out, he immediately kind of says, well, uh, actually, when we look at it um, uh, tactically in, in Britain at the time when Marx was writing, uh, this meant uh, uh, India, uh, that India uh, was going to be the big market for the expansion of the Lancashire cotton industry. But in order for that to happen, uh, the, 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 the sort of the, the, the textile industry indigenously uh, set up in India had to be destroyed. And it was part of what British power was about was to destroy uh, the Indian textile industry in such a way that as to, as to make the way that the Indians would have to consume uh, Lancashire cotton goods. And so the market was taken care of by the opening up of the Lin India market through the destruction uh, of indigenous uh, pop, uh, uh, industrial capacity. Uh, but then uh, India needed to have some uh, uh, way to pay for uh, all of those uh, cotton goods which were coming, and, and that then led to the orchestra orchestration of much of Indian production around the pr production of raw materials. So cotton, uh, raw cotton, hemp, jute, and the like became export products. But as uh, uh, Luxembourg pointed out, uh, these were not really sufficient to cover the, 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 the total value of the, of the cotton which was being imported, and so India needed some other way to pay for it. And uh, here we get into the kind of, uh, again, a violence of, of primitive accumulation, because what Luxembourg points out is that uh, India, in fact, was forced by the British to start to grow opium in large quantities, and then opium was taken to China, 
and forced upon China through the opium wars. The uh, Chinese didn't want opium, but they were forced, you know, Shanghai and all the rest, it was forced open as, as a treaty port through which uh, opium could be sold to the Chinese in large quantities. And the, uh, that opium was paid for by silver, uh, which the Chinese had in abundance. So in effect, Chinese silver then flowed to India and then from India back to Britain. So there was a kind of a, so, so what, what Luxembourg describes is an imperial system, which is about primitive accumulation uh, going on on the periphery, and that that would continue indefinitely until all of the periphery is, is, is absorbed within the capitalist dynamic, in which case then capital would not actually allow for itself, or would not find, be able to find uh, an adequate market to itself. So that this, this story of, uh, of how imperialism is the perpetuation of primitive accumulation on the periphery. And actually, to this day, we will still find uh, what the sorts of things that Marx was talking about going on uh, in, in, in uh, the periphery. For example, uh, the mobilization of the Chinese peasantry into global capitalist production after sort of uh, 1980 or so, is a classic case of primitive accumulation of the sort that Marx describes back in the 17th and 18th centuries, just as happening in China. Similarly, the dispossession of the, uh, the peasantry uh, in uh, India uh, and uh, the increasing wage labor structures in, in, in that country, and the destruction of peasant uh, uh, forms of organization all around the world suggests that the primitive accumulation that Marx was talking about back then uh, has continued as being a feature of a capitalist society. But again, uh, Marx's theory of primitive accumulation is primarily geared uh, not so much to, the, to market questions and raw material questions, so that uh, the primitive accumulation uh, was not so much about uh, the market question and the raw material question as it was about the formation of uh, a global wage labor force. And I think it's significant that uh, the global wage labor force has increased by about 1 billion people since 1980 or so. And so that uh, primitive accumulation in that classic sense uh, still has remains with us. And there is uh, some credence to be given to uh, the Luxembourg question of what happens when the whole of the world has been organized internally within capitalism and there is no external space uh, for primitive accumulation to, uh, to, 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 to go on, in which case uh, we will need, I think, an alternative form uh, parallel to primitive accumulation, which is going to allow for the stabilization of the system, and that is what I will be talking about next time. Thank you for joining me today. You've been listening to David Harvey's Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a Democracy at Work production. A special thank you to the wonderful Patreon community for supporting this project.